Hi everybody, my name is Tom Woodruff and I am a children's book illustrator and program presenter in schools throughout Michigan. Unfortunately, this spring, due to the coronavirus, I have uh, I am going to miss my time with about six schools and about 600 kids and I felt that maybe it would be a good idea to carry on here. My daughter Lydia and I have cobbled together an arrangement here so I can share this uh, share, share this video with you. <laughs> and uh, it's going to get better as time goes on. We haven't done this before, but I, I, I do want to share some things that I think will kind of free us up from the doldrums of being stuck in one place all the way. I call this program the Time Machine, and it's a way that we can travel from where we are in the small confines of our houses or our rooms and and uh, get out and about and, um, and explore through our art skills, simple drawing skills. And this is something anybody can do. I've done this with uh, students from preschool on up through adult. And it all starts out with something very simple. It starts out with a simple dot, just like this. This little dot is the most important mark we ever make. It's the one that says, I'm going to do something, and it starts right here. It looks very insignificant now, but wait till you see what happens. We're going to use this as the introduction to our time machine, and we're going to draw wiggles like this. They come along, like wind blowing, like the top edge of a flag fluttering. Come along here, add another one. Waves on the surface of the water or the lake coming to a waterfall in the river, coming down like this, spilling into the pool, coming across a rolling plain, up the coarse bark of a tree trunk here, and right back to where we started. Notice we have wiggly lines and spaces between them. What we're doing here is we're creating a treasure map. Notice we didn't have to think too much about doing those lines either. They're all just simple parts of wild shapes that we drew when we were little kids uh, sitting at our high chair tray. Now we're going to nibble away, tear away, uh, like right here where a nail was pulled through the paper as it was torn down or a pirate clutched this treasure map so tight it split and cracked there. A mouse nibbled over here and in here maybe it just got so old and frayed and tattered like a photograph in the attic and it just split and fell apart. Now we have a treasure map that can take us on our adventure. If we come back up here to that first dot we created so long ago, and imagine a 45 degree angle coming in about this far, make another dot. We're going to draw some lines now that will, will uh, parallel the lines we drew next to them. So in, we're gonna come along like this, drawing a line that goes up and down, doesn't have to be perfect, it's an old raggedy treasure map. Come over here to your right about to the same point on this side, and then come down this way. Notice I'm not copying the tears, I'm just copying the wiggles, the curves. And we'll come down like this, and like this. We're about to create a masterpiece that's going to take us back in time and far away. So it seems right that we would have a frame, an elegant looking frame like this, made up of four wiggly lines. This not only will frame in our masterpiece, but it gives ourselves room to do other things, perhaps to add a design, a border here to make it look even more grand, uh, maybe to sign our work and we have something to brag about, and maybe even to put a title up above that will tell people more about what's going on in this story. This picture is uh, totally spontaneous. I'm going to make it up as I go, and we're going to start out with a line that uh, we'll start out with a line right about here. Draw a line like this. It's also based on years of doing similar drawings to introduce things like the lumber era, logging and mining in Michigan, or, uh, or ancient life on the Great Lakes. We're going to start out with a line there that looks uh, remarkably like a rock. Draw another one here like this. For many of you students who've drawn with me maybe 20, 30 years ago before you had children of your own, um, long before, <laughs> uh, you remember, maybe remember doing something like this. What we're doing is we're creating two bumps. This first one is larger and closer to us. This other one starts behind it and comes up. It's a little higher in the picture, showing that it's a little further away. And what we're going to do is we're going to go from this simple outline shape that we've done all the way along till now, and we're going to change our styles a little bit. What we're going to do is add some shading. And to do the shading, we're going to kind of look at this curve on your, your, your rock here in the foreground. And I'd like you to kind of copy that shape like this, and as you come down this way, point down to the corner there like that, 
come around here, straighten up in the middle of the rock, and then curve the other way and spread the lines further apart there as it comes around to the side. What this does is show that the sunlight is coming into our drawing from the upper right corner down to the lower left. Sunlight is going to be hitting the surface of the rock here, and the shadow is going to wrap around darker as it comes over to the opposite side. Back when I was in second, third grade, I would have drawn a little curve up here and drawn lines like this with rays, and everybody would know it was the sunshine. If they didn't, I'd put sunglasses on it and a smile, and it would be blatantly obvious. Now what we're doing is we're just drawing the, uh, the effect of the sun itself on the rocks by drawing the shadow. This one here we can do the same thing to maybe make this look a little darker by putting the lines a little closer together. Straighten up in the middle as you come around and bring it over this way. Spread it out a little bit more. This rock right here is a piece of sedimentary rock. We have a lot of this up in Lelanau County where I live. And um, it's made up of layers of limestone. And these layers are separated, or separate, sometimes quite easily. And uh, as, the, as the wind and weather wears them down, you can actually see the layers. And sometimes you can see little shapes of trilobites and brachiopods and mucrospirifers and other creatures that lived here long ago when this was an ancient saltwater sea. You can come over here and overlap. This is called layering. Etchers and engravers of old did this very often. Just draw some lines along in here and show that this, this separation continues even down into this lower area. Sometimes these layers will be so fragile you can actually get your fingers between them and pull them apart and see hollows out on one side and fossils on the other side. It's an amazing thing. This one right here might be a piece of iron ore deposited by glaciers that came through this area long after these Goshen rocks were formed and deposited or dumped their rocks uh, wherever they were when the glacier receded away. So you might find these two rocks from extremely different times so close together. And these are the kind of things uh, kids will find on their way to school and back, walking through the woods. All of us do. We look out, we marvel at the, the things nature has around us to pique our curiosity. Down here, we're going to draw some grasses growing, and these are pretty quick, scribbly lines. Just draw some dark grasses growing up in front. Don't worry about them being perfect. They're just standing up here. If it was a windy day, they'd all be blowing the same way, kind of like your, your hair in the wind. But on this particular day, it's uh, maybe draw some little spikes on one or another here like that. And just think of ground cover here. If you put that in front, it pushes this rock back a little further. If you come up here in this light area of this rock and do this up in this area, you see that the darkness of this grass here pushes this rock a little closer to us. And by doing it up in here, it does the same thing. So, And notice the grass is getting smaller back here, making it look a little further away. If you come up here with a wiggly line, kind of like our outer border here, it comes up like that, and another one coming up this way broken and wiggly, just like the lines we made on our border, maybe a little wigglier. You have a, uh, a place where you can bring branches out from the sides of your trees, through the sides of your trees, from an area more towards the front, as though these branches are coming towards us. This one here is going to come out like that and maybe break off about there. This one here didn't get much light or just broke off when it was little. And these here are coming up. Notice they're they're reaching out and up for the light that they need to process the chlorophyll that, or from the leaves that process chlorophyll that uh, helps the tree grow. Notice this tree is not straight. Notice it's a little crooked here where this curves in. When I do something like that, I bring it down like this and I can build it in and correct it. I can draw a little curve there like that, one here and here, one there. You might even have a hollow here or maybe another one here, a stump where branches broke off. Or maybe a small owl uh, made a nest in here. A woodpecker started it and the owl moved in. Or maybe a family of chipmunks or squirrels. Up here in this tall branch, draw a little shape like that and think of a beehive. Think of springtime now. You have a lot of small branches here. They get smaller and smaller as they come out. Like this. And this one here coming up. I know I'm moving along pretty quickly. I'm kind of sure what I'm doing here, but it's been a while. I'm a little rusty myself. Um, you want to just go ahead and, and add these 
as you like. I'm going to keep it pretty much in this range here because we've got a lot to do over in this side, so I don't want to crowd that space too much. Um, I'm going to add one more line coming up here behind this tree, just like this, to suggest that we're at the edge of a forest. Uh, so we have two trees here now. To make this tree in the back stand back a little further, I'm going to draw lines like this. I'm going to make them a little curvy, a little dark. And what this is is just a chance to put a dark shadow along our light border, which will make the border stand out, and it'll make that tree in the back look further away. Remember the sunlight is coming into our drawing from the upper right corner. If we start over here and think of the cylinder-like shape of this tree, how it curves around and how as we look up it, the curve gets a little greater. It's a little straight on here, but as you go up, it's going to be more like this. Draw some curved lines coming over. Leave a little light along the edge of the tree on the left edge. And that's called edge lighting, and that just gives you a chance when you add color to this to put a different color in there, maybe a cooler color than the warm color you might have on the right-hand side. If the sun is coming in this way, then the branch is going to have shadows on the left-hand side and the top of these here. So just a few little lines to suggest that. And on this side, we're going to draw the lines on the bottom. The sunlight will be coming in and hitting the top of the branch whatever shows is sticking out in this direction. So I'm just going to darken that in a little bit. Now if I was drawing this with a pencil, I'd be able to hold the side of my pencil and shade and blend. And I'm using a Sharpie pen. If I, so I, I can't erase. If I, if I made a mistake, I would figure a way to build it in. With a pencil, you can. You can go back and forth and adjust. Um, the light side of the tree is going to stay pretty much light, but the middle of the tree, instead of carrying in with more lines like this and spreading them apart, I'm going to use a texture like this, sort of like, sort of like um, caterpillars running up and down the tree, running, crawling up and down the tree, and just have these little marks that suggest the coarse bark of an old oak tree or an old aspen or no, an aspen, maybe a beech or a birch. Well, not even a birch tree. Well, it could be if we wanted to change the shape of the bark. Um, but go ahead and, and just give it a texture. Now notice that the variety of the textures in this drawing is what making, what's making this look more interesting. If you add a leaf like this, another one like that, just little scribbles, that's about all you need at this distance. If you were close up, these leaves might look a bit different. Maybe like this one down here. Draw a line that curves up like that. And draw a little loop over the top here. One here like this, and one here, another one here, and another one here, and so on. And you see we have an oak leaf. So what we have is a white oak leaf, and what we'll do is we'll continue to draw these here, coming up and wrapping around wherever you can fit them in, just to give a little bit of texture. Also, if you put some along the side of this tree, right along in here, you get that dark texture next to the bright white, sunny side of that tree, and that makes the tree look a little bit more rounded, a little more sunny, more uh, prominent. It gives a little more three dimension to our drawing. This beehive up here has a little opening here where the sentry is stationed, and around it you have other bees coming out here. They're looking for those early flowers here. So down here, draw, draw a flower. Draw some of the early spring flowers growing that the bees would be looking for. And these are just a bunch of little scribbles that will look more realistic if you add some color to them later. Right over here, we're going to draw a kind of a deep looking letter C shape. It's going to come around like that and back. Our drawing is going to take us back a little over 100 years. Up here in Leelanau, back it would be right around 100 years, 120, somewhere. And draw a line coming down like this. And what I'd like you to do now is um, create a texture bark, kind of like we have here. But this, this tree, this stump of a tree here is so close to us that the bark is going to look much more realistic, much more believable. So what I'd like you to do is get your pencil kind of going back and forth like this and pretend you had uh, one too many Mountain Dews or a little too much coffee. And I'd like you to just get your pencil moving in a nervous kind of way, coming down here and up there and down and up and just go back and forth, almost like an old-fashioned typewriter. 
don't hear that word very much nowadays. Uh, come in here, and then as you come over to the right, just spread them apart a little bit further, further and further, until you end up with a, a sense of roundness created by the dark left-hand side merging to the lighter right-hand side. On this tree, if you draw very lightly, on this stump, draw very lightly a bunch of a bunch of curves here, these letter C shapes. These are concentric curves going around the center of this tree, and there might be a hundred of them or more, 80, 100, 120, who knows? Back in the day, these trees were enormous, and they covered much of southern Michigan, northern Michigan, actually, the pines up in this area, but southern Michigan around Grand Rapids area, heavy with the hardwoods and uh, ideal for furniture making and cabinetry, and up here, a lot of pine for building. Next line we we're going to draw starts back here, just a little hint of it, coming through that branch, coming down through here. It's going to come out here like this. It's going to bump and wiggle a little bit. When it gets to right here, I'd like you to come back, tuck in here, tuck in there a little bit, and then come back out and then back in again. You can almost imagine water lapping up against the shore here. If you take these little bumps here, and you think of the shape of our rocks in this area, uh, just look at the left-hand curve of that one bump. Find one of these, and then just draw some little lines like that. It's like a sideways tornado shape. It's wide, and it gets skinny as it comes around to the light or to the right. Draw another rock in here, coming around. During the lumber era, when the forests were cleared, there were rocks left, much as much where they were left by the glaciers and reshaped and positioned by the rivers that took their place and or it took the glacier's place. And so we have rocks everywhere. Ask any farmer who ever had to clear a field how important it was to get rid of those to protect their plow blades. And that would have been the first step. But now if you drop lines down like this, you see we're not right at the edge of the river. We're standing on a high bluff that'll give us a chance to look further back into the drawing, lift us up a little higher. And we can take a little bit of a land here and come down like that, even cut that back in a little bit here. There'll be a shadow on this little piece of side there, but on this side here, you'll see darkness that comes out to light where the strata, the layers of sediment built up here, sometimes very pronounced, sometimes pretty well blended, but this gives a little shadow in the hollow area there, and again, contributes to the roundness or the dimension, uh, the three-dimensional element of that cliff. Makes it look a little further away. Down in here, I'd like you to just sort of scribble some foliage in this area here. Have some coming up here, too. We have a tall area here, and this sort of frames it in. Again, if you put it up close to that close to that border and tuck it over here a little bit, you could have some plants of different kinds, and this accentuates the lightness of the tree stump itself. And I'm going to carry it up behind that tear to kind of accentuate that as well. So it looks like this is definitely in the foreground, closer to us even perhaps than this area over here. A long time ago when I was, um, when I was in fourth, fifth grade, a friend of my dad's, who was a writer-producer at the uh, uh, University of Michigan Television Center, um, uh, a friend of my dad's who worked in the art department, a man named Dale Smith, we called him Smythe, uh, showed me this trick. And it's just a, a loop here like this, and it comes up and over. This is nothing new. It's been used for hundreds of years by artists, but to me it was brand new. I loved drawing boats back in that day. Um, I always dreamed of being a sailor and actually went on to become one, but I, I learned that if I drew these lines like this, um, it would give me a shape that, if I was to bring it around like this, looked a little bit like a lopsided figure eight shape, uh, a lazy figure eight lying on its side. And uh, the, the little area here back here looks looked like, in this, in this case, it's going to look like it's farther away. And as this object we're about to draw comes closer and closer, it gets higher, wider, rounder, more full. As you go further towards the back, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you think of this as a guide for us, everything that is at the front of this boat we're creating will be larger, wider, taller than at the back. Way at the back here, you have a little line coming down like that, showing it's far away. Right here, 
as you come up over this curve, come right to the top and then just over slightly to about right there. See how it curves up and over a bit. Draw a line now that comes down. This line is not much smaller than the, uh, the line back there, but by drawing it this way and stretching it out, it makes it look like it's closer to us. Draw a line parallel to it, and you have the stem, the leading edge of this boat as it's pushing through the water towards the shore, towards the coast. If you draw a line over here, you see the other side, what would be the port side of this boat, the left side coming towards us. It comes down there. If you uh, look at this shape, how it angles down, and look at the suggested line that we have going from here to here that angles up, this gives us that perspective that carries our boat into the background. Instead of drawing a line like this or drawing a wiggle, what we're going to do is put a splash at the bow of the boat here. I'll turn another one up in there like that so you can see the boat is churning through the water. And then right about here, I'm going to add a little plume of water there, maybe add a splash here, another splash over there. From right about here, draw a line that comes up. This will be the bow wake where the water pushes away from the bow or the front edge, the leading edge of the boat, forward. And then the midship wake in the middle of this boat is actually right about where this dot is. Most of the boat appears to be in the front or the, uh, the larger front half. Draw a line that comes up here like this, and it's going to come across and wiggle off to the side. And here's another one tucking up under here. This is the tumble home or the boat coming along in there. So you have these waves getting smaller and smaller as they go further back. To make it look like these waves are strong enough to hold up a boat, we're going to add some waves. I'm, I'm going to leave this area open down here. I've got some ideas that I might want to pursue, but I'm going to start right up about in here, and I'm going to draw some dark lines sweeping up like this. And they're going to get lighter as they get up to the top. What we're drawing is the trough, or the low area of the wave here. There's going to be a shadow from the boat right in here coming up like that. We'll come over the crest of this wave and drop into the trough of the next one and draw lines like this and lines coming up there. And then do that one more time if you come into this stern wake back in here, quarter wake. This is the midship wake in here, in the middle of the ship. So you come back there and now you get this, this sense of these boats fading into the background. To have this boat coming in this way, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a shape that comes along here like this and um, a couple of pilings here like this. Just a couple, just to show, and make that a little bit smaller over there and angle these a bit. And we're gonna draw lines like these to suggest an angle to these planks down below. Darken this in a little bit, darken that in a little bit. And then we can kind of calm this water down a little bit as we get in this area here. And let this boat kind of be easing in towards, probably checking down its engine and going to be coming in here, and I'm going to darken up a little bit along this stump here. And uh, then carry these lines across a little bit, calm them down a little bit, just a little bit more peaceful in the distance there as they go across. If you add some curvy lines like these, you add the billowing spray at the bow of the boat, splash, and remember you can splash more water out there, and just a few little lines in this area here. This will be calmer and more sunlit on this side, say, or just further away. Same thing, just to take that back. There's a line that comes across the top. This is a plank that runs the length of the boat. It comes up here like this and wraps around. And then there's another one underneath it, but remember as we come closer to us, everything gets wider further apart than it is further back. So start quite close to that first rail or the bottom of that rail and then as you come up here spread this out a little bit to bring it up like that and wrap it around and do the same thing with the bottom of it here and then down in here we'll draw another line and this will be for the water line this one here is actually since we're, we're looking down at it this actually curves down and up a little bit and around Back in this day, people had different color schemes for their, that represented their different individual companies, their boat lines, their fleets. And you can pretty much make this up as you like. Down below, we'll have some 
bottom paint here. Maybe this is a red lead of some kind. We're going to leave this starboard, or the port side here, this uh, lighter area, the sunlit side, bright, even though it might be a dark colored paint. The reflection of the light will make that bright as day. Um, on this side here, though, we're in the shadow, so I think I'll take these same kind of lines and draw this next layer here with lines a little further away. Maybe this is a, uh, a gray color or a, a shadowed white color in here. This color up here could be any color you want it to be your favorite color. Uh, there's some things going on in here. One of them is this right here, this little hole here called the hawse pipe or the hawse, and that's where the anchor come anchor chain comes out of. In here is the anchor locker and uh, the chain locker. And, and, and then along in here, we're going to add um, a, a line coming down here like this. And right in the middle, right where the where that second, that first dot there is that started this whole thing, draw another one. But notice this is wide here. This one gets a little narrower. Way back here, it's smaller yet. Now, if we were drawing the Black Pearl from Pirates of the Caribbean, we could line this whole boat with cannon and have them sticking out and have 20 or 30 of these ports or 9 or 10, and it would look very, very fancy. It would take us hours. But right now, we're using these as as uh, companionways going into uh, into different uh, storage areas on the boat, the forward locker, and midship, and after. Um, Back in here, very often they would have, instead of doors, which could be um, burst in by the waves, they would have planks that fit into slots, and they could stack the planks, and as they came into port, they could undo those. Have a guy standing right here just to get a sense of scale, just draw a little head and shoulders. <coughs> Excuse me. And then back in here, um, you won't see much of that. You can darken it in as though it's open. This one here goes into the uh, goes into the forward uh, cargo hold. This one here goes into the engine room, and way in the back, after end there. This one goes into the after storage area, the after cargo hold. Um, this leading edge here, the stem of our boat, actually continues up a little higher. Bring it up here like this and like this. And then if you come back right, right after this, uh, this entry here, uh, draw a little curve coming up, and a line angling forward and up just a little bit, and then another one coming up like this. What this is doing is it's creating this area up above here, which is known as the forecastle or forward castle back in early times. It's a raised area that provides a space for the crew members of the boat to live place where they have their bunks. Back in early days, they would have had hammocks swinging from the uh, overhead. Right here is an opening that goes into the windlass room with a machine called the windlass, or uh, actually it's more like the wind lass back in pirate days. Um, this is the capstan that raises up the anchor, uh, the anchor chain. And uh, there's a porthole here that goes in the uh, in that room so that the operator can see what's going on. And behind it, you might have portholes going into the rooms of the individual crew members, oftentimes two to a, two to a room. Right here, I've got another little hole. And this is actually a, a, a hawse pipe, kind of like it's where the, uh, where the, you have a line that comes down here, just draw a light line. When they get close to the dock, there'll be a guy standing right here and he will, he will throw that line over to somebody on the dock and they'll put it around one of these pilings or better yet, a spile or a stump like this if it's in a very rugged area. And uh, then they can use the steam winch on the boat to pull against that, pull that line against and tug the, tug the boat into shore. There's a sight pole that comes out here that's used by the wheelsman to aim, line up the, uh, line up the boat as it's coming into channels and harbors. On an old sailing ship, this would be the bowsprit, and you'd have triangular sails attached to that. Right about here, there is a, a line that sticks up like this. It's higher than this one. Actually, it's not higher than this, but just about halfway in between here and here. Way at the after end, far away, you have a line that is only that high. Remember, as we go further back, things are going to get smaller and here they get larger. Notice also that as they come forward they get higher up. This is higher up here. This is even higher up yet. It's going to come up like that. Draw a curve like the top of a badminton or a tennis net and draw another line here that widens out as it comes up underneath 
And then right here, do that again, but a little closer together. This is a railing along the side of the cabins up above. I'm going to thicken that out a little bit. Uh, if you draw some posts here like this coming down, make sure they get closer and closer and closer as you go further back. These are posts that are holding up the boat deck, and you'll see what that is in just a minute. That boat deck is, um, uh, is something that comes up about this far, and then it's going to curve over here, and you make a letter F shape, and these angle down a little bit as they go over towards the right-hand side. If you turn that into a box like that, you now see the upper deck. And if you darken in this line down here and make it taper back behind those posts, you can see the overhanging roof that protects the promenade deck along here, along the side, which on a passenger ship would be a place where people could sit in their in their their lounge chairs and and watch the world go by, or or maybe the doors going into the staterooms or even to the great room where they would entertain the uh uh, you know, they have entertained the passengers and have uh, dinners and that sort of thing. Right up here, we have a shape that looks a little bit like a football. Put another one in here like this, smaller, and the smallest one of all right back here. If you put a line down the center like this on each one, you see the bow of the lifeboat here, and if you draw curvy lines like these, it suggests the canvas that's stretched over the top of the lifeboats that keeps the water out of those open boats until they're, until they're necessary. Um, to lower the boats, back in this day, they had davits that looked like candy canes here. They come up and over. Notice this one is highest, this one's lower, this one gets lower yet, and this one is lowest of all. You have lines, very light lines, coming down here. These are the falls that lower the boats down to the boarding level here and eventually down into the water in an emergency. Right here, I'm going to draw a line that comes up behind this behind this uh, lifeboat. And it's going to come up, and I'm going to curve it around like this. It's going to come over like that and down. What we're doing is we're creating a forward cabin area here, and this will be a place will be the uh, place where... Uh, you could have the uh, captain's stateroom down below here, and uh, and down below you have uh, maybe a dunnage room there, and up in here you can have some portholes along. And you can have a stairway entry starting back in here going up inside so the waves and the wind don't get it, so we'll just hollow that out back in there so they can get up to this level. Up here is where you're going to find the pilot house. We'll draw the pilot house with a little line there. It's going to come up higher. See the angle is steeper here. As you come around to the side, I'm angling over a little more steeply than this, and I'm going to drop straight down there so you see the pilot house up above. These are all built differently on different boats. Everybody had a better idea of how to do it, and this is how the designs on the boats on the lakes changed over time. Uh, you have a kind of a projection out here to keep some of the water off the windows, and these are the windows that wrap around. It. Your captain could be able to see out in all directions from the side, and you have these mullions, these posts that, that support those smaller pieces of glass. On the Great Lakes, you could easily have waves that could sweep up and smash into these windows, smash into the pilot house. These are, these are big boats for their time, but uh, small in comparison to a storm on Lake Superior by far. If you draw a little line here and uh, kind of follow this curve, but draw these small little uh, wave-like shapes coming around, this is the summer deck up here. This is these are this is just a canvas that's stretched around, and it it uh, it's held up by the stanchions, the posts that uh, support the lifelines that go around. So the this will, this canvas will be fluttering and pressing against it. On some boats, they have ornate uh, canopies up here, built like on the the finest liners and. And this one here, we're going to keep it kind of easy there. Um, back in here, you can have a door going into the pilot house. You can have a door and a window into the chart room there. And up here, draw somebody standing here. Remember this guy down here, how big he is? Draw this little tiny person up here. He's waving at you. This might be the watchman. He's keeping an eye out for logs in the water from some of the rafts that would break apart as they were being towed across the lakes or um, bits of debris. And also maybe just um, keep an eye on... How, they're, how close they are to coming into the dock and where they're going to tie up. Right here, I'm going to draw a, um, a stick that comes up like this. This is the mast, the forward mast. 
And this mast is quite tall, and to get up there, you have, yeah, you put a cross tree right here like this. It angles down like that. In fact, the higher you go, the more things angle down again. Um, from here, draw some lines coming down to this deck, and, um, and then draw some little lines going across. These are actually sticks or, or pieces of wood, like stair treads that come up and make it possible to for a, a watchman or, or somebody who needs to get above here to, uh, to climb up. It's one of the most amazing places to be on a boat like this. Up above, them, my mast is going right off there. Um, I'm going to draw a, a pennant flying like this, fluttering in the wind, maybe company colors. And I'm going to twist a line back and forth like this to make it look like it's really fluttering in the wind. When you get a chance, make that flag your favorite color. I'd like you to put the first letter of your last name on the top here. Mine's W for Woodruff. Go ahead and put your first letter of your first name there. Uh, this is uh, your company flag. Maybe the color of the flag would be the same as the color of this stripe along here, this one here. So in an emergency, spotters on shore could spot the boat and identify it, notify the company, and they could uh, secure all the things that they needed in order to rescue the crew and and uh, know who, where the boat was from and where it was going and all that. There's a line coming from the mast down here to the pilot house, and there's another one. We'll bring one all the way down here to the sight pole like that. And, um, and on this, I'm just going to draw some little flags flying. Now, these are going to get smaller and smaller as they go up, and you know, they flutter this way and that. By making them large here and small there, again, it makes it look more like you're looking up and farther away. You might even have a flag or two on here. Maybe it's a festive occasion. Maybe on this passenger ship, there are people who are coming into port, and maybe they've immigrated all the way from Europe, and they finally are approaching the land that's going to be their new home for generations to come. As a matter of fact, you can draw a whole bunch of people up here while you're at it. See how easy that is? Draw a bunch of people looking out. They're pointing over that way. Wow, there's grandma, and you got people who came here earlier, and they're waiting for, they're waiting for uh, their families to arrive. So this would be a festive occasion. Right here, there's a smokestack coming up, and um, I'm going to put that right about here. Remember this opening down below that goes into the engine room? Smokestack would be quite close to that, and. Um, Smokestack is going to have a, a dark top rim here, maybe to help the coal soot blend in, or maybe that's just the coal soot itself. We'll leave a stripe here and uh, another curve, and down below it might be black or it might be some other color. But right here, I'd like you to take that same letter you put on the flag, and I'd like you to squeeze it over to the back side of this. So my W is going to look like that kind of, so you don't hardly even read it as a W. But that's one more sign that this is a boat from my fleet. From the top of this stack, I'd like you to draw a billowing cloud of smoke. This is coal smoke, coal soot, and coal smoke. Back here, out in the distance here, it fades away into the atmosphere. But up close here, it's going to be very dark and almost shiny as it pops out from the top of the mast or puffs out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with lines like this that are kind of far away. I'm going to draw that darker shadow underneath this curve. The same lines I used on the tree here, but now drawn in such a way that they suggest the darkness of the coal smoke and the fullness or the roundness of that plume as it trails off into the distance. Right here, there's a shape that looks like a periscope. It comes up and over and around, and it takes fresh air down into the engine room. And a little further behind here, you're going to have another, another mast sticking up. I'm going to draw that coming right through as though the smoke is coming off from the engine and puffing towards the background. You could have another engine, another um, smokestack on this if you wanted to. They're going to have lines coming down here. And there's going to be a line that comes from somewhere up at the cross tree here all the way to the front like that, all the way to the forward mast. In time, on the Titanic, this would be made out of metal, and it would became, became the antenna. Uh, they carried the warnings that were not heated. And, um, but still, first, uh, first time sending messages on the ocean. And from back here, you, you're probably not going to see it because in the distance where the boat wraps around, this is where the American flag would be. You might see just a little hint of it fluttering in the distance there from the stern of the boat. 
This boat is operating at a time when you have a lot of little fishing boats like these. These are called Mackinac boats, and these would be out in their little sloop rig boats like this, sometimes schooners, and they're busy, you know, often gaff rig like that, and up busy catching fish. And, and this was the trade boat of, of uh, the waters of Michigan and the Great Lakes back in the day. Could have seen dozens and dozens of these tied up at the dock, and some were used for lumber, others for transporting pretty much anything, any goods that were being raised and uh, or grown and and um, shipped elsewhere. In the distance here, I'd like you to draw a line that comes down like this, bumps into the boat. Imagine it continuing down further and further into the distance like this until it drops down into the water. So you can see that this boat is entering into a harbor from an opening over here, which is probably wide open, but this this uh, this dune or this, this hill in the foreground kind of blocks the vastness of that opening. Out here on the end, if you draw a little tower coming up like that and draw a little house next to it, you have a lighthouse. In early days, without lighthouses, there were so many uh, sinkings and wreckages that happened. Uh, lighthouses provided a warning and also uh, also heralded or announced a safe harbor from a distance so boats could aim for that light and and they have a little uh, little stick up top for a lightning rod and and they have a keeper's house next to it and maybe back in here they have a, another house for the boat crew maybe even down here if a boat was uh, being driven onto shore a life-saving crew could be launched from here and they'd go out and they would rescue the people from this boat uh, sometimes two three four at a time sometimes well as much as the boat could carry they have to row out and back there's a little shadow down here that's around that point and off to the left uh, back here if you draw a bunch of trees this is very much what the landscape looked like back then there weren't a whole lot of buildings sometimes this lighthouse would be in a very remote spot uh, in fact, even now, very often you see that with lighthouses. As communities have grown, they get closer and closer to the lighthouses. And and you just kind of imagine that out there like that. Let's leave this light so the boat doesn't get too mixed in with it, but just to be aware of that distant shore. Back in here, I'm going to carry this line, make sure it's right about there. I'm going to come in like that. And then back in here, I'm just going to start drawing little triangles with boxes underneath them. Uh, this could be a uh, this could be a fish packing plant here. You might have nets drying nearby. This over here could be an outbuilding from a lumber mill. You might see a stack, burn off stack for the scrap from the lumber mill. Um, this boat has smoke that's blowing back this way. This one here might have just smoke that's coming up like that. The boat smoke is blowing back because the boat is moving. The wind back here might be a little more still. If you have businesses here and a place where people can make a living, you're going to have houses back here. And these houses would be built from the wood that's being harvested from the land nearby. And uh, you have a town beginning to grow. And if you have houses back here, you have windows in the houses, and you might see kids looking out of those windows, see moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas come from all over the place on boats like these, bringing their cultures, their traditions. They might have different churches, different faiths. Uh, they might need a uh, school building back here. Once that uh, little log cabin doesn't work anymore, uh, they might have uh, county buildings like this, government buildings of different kinds, factories to service the growing industry coming along here. And back on the hill that used to be covered with forests, kind of like these last remnants of trees, just scribble them back in there in the distance. Now these trees might be, uh, again, 150 feet tall, 80, 90, 100 that's all been cleared here, and the rocks like these have been cleared, and you have, you have uh, furrowed land here that is being tended and plowed to raise crops to feed the people in this village here. And when they have an excess, they can load them on boats like these and others and ship them to other places where those crops are needed or where, those, where that produce is needed. Um, back in here, I'm just going to draw some bumps, and this is kind of the fun, easy part. I'm just going to take these clouds, and I'm going to make them kind of go down a little bit as they go back into the distance, kind of to suggest, the, uh, to accentuate the boat coming towards us. On the left-hand sides of each of these cotton candy-looking clouds, you can draw little swirls like this that suggest the fullness and the roundness of the cloud. And when you get up in here, if you add two bumps, 
You can call it a seagull. Try that here and here too. Draw another couple over here. If you have boats like this coming in and fishing boats like this, you can have seagulls everywhere in abundance. Back in this day, that would have been an everyday occurrence. Even now it is. Uh, if you want to add a little more drama to your drawing, you can draw some curvy lines. Uh, I'm going to draw them like this, kind of just, just putting a shadow above those clouds in there. Not too much around here, just enough to make the clouds stand out. And um, maybe come down in here a little bit to pull, a, pull our eye down into the drawing and towards the boat itself. Okay, once we've gotten that far, we've got a couple more things to do. Down here is where I'd like you to sign your name, sign your masterpiece, put your Pablo Picasso right there. And over here, I'd like you to remember when you did this. So what I'd like you to do is write a 3 for March, a 31, the last day of March. And over here, we're going to write a 2-0. Now, this could be even 1920. It could be even earlier than that. It could be 1900. It could be 1890s. You have boats like these back in that day. Up here is where I'd like you to write a title. I'm going to leave that to you. Write a title here. Something about something that links you to this picture. Maybe think of your time on this boat, your journey. Or maybe you know some of your family history, where your family came from and, and how they got here. And I think that's where I'm going to leave it. I'm glad you got a chance to join me in this little adventure to get out of our houses, to get a little bit away from, uh, away from the concerns of the world today. Hope you had a good time. Don't forget to add color to this. Color will make this just beautiful. You can make your colors more faded in the background, more bold in the foreground, and add to that three-dimensional quality. And I can't wait to drive with you again. I hope you join me, and um, have a great day. Be safe.